I was hired by the government of Sardar to work in the archaeological site at the church of Santa Anastasia in Sardara to dig up the skeletons of giants. The bones of giants were buried among the Nuraga ruins and tombs beneath the church of Santa Anastasia. We even discovered two dead giants embracing each other. They were complete skeletons. The larger one was over nine feet tall. I measured it with an architect from Milan. Whenever we found the bones of giants, we would carry them into the church. Everything went into the church. The bones, the artifacts, everything. We would arrange them on a large table inside of the church. There were bones of both normal sized people and giants. Every day that table would be full of artifacts. The bones of the giants were enormous. Hands, feet and skulls three or four times the size of ours. But everything would disappear overnight. The next day there would be nothing left. Everything would just disappear. It was always like that. As soon as we would find something, the next day everything would be gone. And we never knew where that stuff went. discovered that legends are often shadows of the truth, dark silhouettes that paint the contours of historical fact. Much like dry riverbeds carved into the desert floor, if we follow them carefully, they can lead us to the fountains of their biblical genesis. Footprints of history's true legends have led us to the desert southwest of the United States, where our path has converged with Tom Horn, a fellow researcher who has been investigating the mysterious disappearance of the Anasazi Indians. To pick up the trail of the Anasaze, we would have to explore the last traces of their ancient civilization in the high mesas of Colorado and New Mexico. Anasazi were an ancient people that flourished in the Four Corners region of the United States for thousands of years until something drove them into the cliffs of the canyons and they disappeared. The official story says that the Anasaze simply migrated out of the region because of drought. But the fortresses they built in the cliffs before their sudden disappearance suggest something much more gruesome may have happened. E -O -T -A -Y -A. 
Legend records that giants devoured them all. Our third generation medicine man made the point that if we would have asked his grandfather why they would have gone through such Herculean efforts to move all this debris, right? They had to bring all of this from way down in the valley up here to build this edifice. It was because a portal opened, a doorway, and the giants came up out of the earth. And around the same time that Moses is on the other side of the world writing in, there were giants in the earth in those days. So it was a testament that they were trying to build something here to defend themselves from uh, against something that was incredible, astonishing. The traditional narrative concerning the Anasazi is that over a long period of time, nine years, they gradually migrated away from this area because of drought. The problem is you don't build a fortified position with towers to defend yourself from drought. But what we're finding here and what we see evident in the ruins is a sudden disappearance. This was a people group that was in a very defensive position. They were in a defensive mode. They were fearing for their lives, defending themselves against some kind of an external threat. Well, another thing, that official narrative that they slowly migrated out of the area over a nine-year period of time, the reason that doesn't work is because when the first archaeologists came in here, they found these rooms packed with salt, with uh, weapons, with the little boards that they carried their babies around on. These are not things you would have left behind if you slowly migrated out of the area. They were literally gone overnight. And even the archaeological evidence from different digs around here is they could never account. The anthropologists had a hard time figuring why the brutality, right. the brutality associated with the disappearance of the Anasazi. It's almost like they were eaten on the run. The news is coming out that the evidence that the archaeologists first were basing some wrong conclusions on has now been set aside. This was the violent overthrow yes. of the Anasazi. To get to the bottom of the story of the Anasazi, we had the rare opportunity of meeting with a third generation medicine man by the name of Dr. Don Mose, who is an academic in the Navajo Nation. And I asked him specifically, what happened with the Anasazi, these legendary pre-Pueblo Indians that lived around Mesa Verde and Chaco Canyon, but they seemed to disappear literally overnight. And so Dr. Mose begins telling us the story that is the sanitized version that you might even hear from some of the state parks department guides about how there was an extended um, drought. And so they slowly migrated out of the Four Corners area of the United States and later on became the Hopi, the Zuni, other uh, Pueblo Indians of today. But when I challenged that and said, well, why then, if they slowly migrated out of the Four Corners area, did they leave behind everything that would have been important to them? And when I ask him that question, he looks right into the camera and he says, well, I should not tell you this, but if you would have asked my great grandfather, here's the story that he would have told. And then he begins telling this epic, if you will, of a time before time when doorways in the Four Corners area of the United States opened and giants came up from out of the earth and began persecuting and cannibalizing the Anasazi and the Anasazi fled for their lives. And this was the first great clue that we had, that if we went back to the original stories of the Pueblo Indians, we would receive an entirely different narrative that involved the arrival of this reptilian being that deceived the Anasazi, that taught them how to use their kivas for pharmacia, 
what Dr. Mose called sorcery. And in those kivas that were excavated around Chaco Canyon, artifacts were found that indicated ritual cannibalism had started among the Anasazi. Teeth bones, finger bones, found inside their kivas, which Dr. Mose said was a kind of witchcraft that led the Anasazi to opening these doorways of the earth through which the giants came. This is part of Chaco Canyon. Um, everybody today, the experts all say that this was probably the capital of the Anosaze. And also, you know, it's, what I found interesting was how some of our uh, Indian guides and members of the tribes, they also refer to this as the Babylon of the Anasaze history. Very mysterious stuff was going on here, and part of that we might assume was happening inside these kivas. Now, we just learned that there were more than 40 of these very, very large kivas. These are some of the largest kivas I've ever seen. What is a kiva? The kivas were religious edifices. Some of the tribes would only allow the men to go in them, and it was in there that they did rituals, they did prayers, they put themselves into contact with um, other dimensional entities, the Kachinas. Inside the Kiva is a doorway called the Sipapu. It's a mystical doorway that can be opened. Kachinas. Inside the Kiva is a doorway called the Sipapu. It's a mystical doorway that can be opened if the rituals are performed correctly. Dr. Don Mose told us that story of the, of the portal opening in the Four Corners area. This reptilian being comes through. But key to this, he said they start, this thing started teaching the, uh, the natives when they went into their Kivas to practice sorcery to practice witchcraft, right? And that was when he said, through the Sipapu, through the holy doorways that are in the Kivas, maybe a mystical doorway opened. But suddenly, these very terrifying entities, these beings, including the giants, emerged onto the earth and began cannibalizing, destroying. In the petroglyphs, even right here in Chaco Canyon, are the giant six-toed uh, footprints and six-fingered fingerprints at a place called San Canyon Pueblo, not far from here, evidence of violence, of, of, of people being torn literally from limb to limb, children, women, none of this uh, matches tribal warfare uh, the way that we would have understood it. This was something entirely different that happened here. Uh, but in those kivas, they found strange artifacts. In each of the kivas, one finger from the hand, three teeth from the mouth, it was sorcery. It was black magic, we would call it, right? And it evidently did open a doorway. So according to ancient Navajo tradition, the Anasazi people opened some kind of a portal and unleashed something dark and sinister on the earth, possibly well, in this very location. I would not say that it's Navajo tradition. Uh, what I would say is that some of their medicine men would admit that that is actually what happened here. During our expedition in the desert southwest, we met with some of the elders of the Pueblo Indians to discuss their knowledge relating to the giants and stargates. Native Americans still keep the ancient traditions and legends of their ancestors. Much of America's true history is known only to the medicine men and the initiates of the tribal societies. Among the closely guarded secrets they keep from the outside world is information regarding the race of giants that once inhabited the Americas and the portals through which some of them were fabled to have emerged. 
Pueblo Indian friends related many things to us off camera that they didn't want us to record. One of the most astonishing things that they told us pertained to the activation of what they called stargates. We were told that the highest ranking medicine men from each tribe gathered together every year in a specific location in the desert to open a dimensional portal, a stargate. And this isn't some kind of vision quest or peyote hallucination. According to them, their medicine men know how to open the gates. They describe the gate to us in technological terms. In other words, it has physical composition. It's not merely a metaphysical abstraction. They talked about a screen-like apparatus that when activated has the appearance of flowing water. And they claim that their medicine men are able to communicate with entities on the other side of the gate and even receive foreknowledge of important events in advance. They told us of the moment in which they had received the vision of 911 days before it had happened and they were all so very troubled by the fact that they saw these planes moving through the air crashing into these tall buildings and they even knew it was going to be in New York City but it was how it happened when they and the medicine men went to a very specific area and they came very close to telling us where this one specific area is at where there is a stargate an active gateway an active portal, a doorway of some kind. After witnessing the events of 9-11 in advance, the medicine men went around briefing the tribes on what they had seen in the Stargate and warning their people to stay away from New York City. As unbelievable as it sounds, all of the Pueblo Indians we spoke with confirmed the story. But the other part of that vision, that gateway, that doorway, that opened in which they saw into the future was that they knew at that moment that this had something to do in their worldview with us entering into the final world phase. Their worldview, this was a moment in which they understood that now we're entering into the fourth world, a time in which the giants are going to be reanimated, that are going to return to the earth in a time of great tribulation. I was shocked that they were willing to share that information with us. My name is Clifford Mahudi. I am a Zuni Pueblo elder. They were giants according to our Zuni history and legends, and of course it became mythology. And there was a lot of references to that in other systems such as the medicine societies and in all the, the rituals that we used to go through. And there has been many stories about it. First of all, it's one of the ones that I remember very well is that they actually used to live underground. And uh, this is where they supposedly live is in the, in the under, what we call the underworld. It's not, the, uh, it's not uh, what we consider the fourth world, but it's the underworld system that they, they, come, they come out of at certain times. So the giant people were around here and also that they would migrate to other, to other Pueblo people uh, in their domains at that time. And one of the uh, things that I learned when I used to go up to the Paiute Nation was they actually had some red-headed giants that are buried up there. I have a friend that is like a, uh, a mountain climber type person. He goes out there and and collects a lot of uh, ancient stuff out there in the desert. And he talks about the burial places of the red-headed giants. And he doesn't talk up to anybody because they know he knows that if they found out, they're going to take those bones. And in the past, usually the museums took them and they disappeared. The greatest cover-up in history is the cover-up of history. And in the United States, no other organization has covered up more history than the Smithsonian Institution. Based in Washington, D.C. and funded primarily by the federal government, the Smithsonian Institution has exhumed, confiscated, and sequestered thousands of out-of-place artifacts in America since the year of its founding in 1846. Originally established by its founder, James Smithson, 
for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. The institution was quickly hijacked in its early years by Darwinist doctrinaires, who turned it into a propaganda machine for the theories of evolution and isolationism. Isolationism is an anthropological doctrine which asserts that ancient American societies were isolated from the outside world and delegitimizes the notion that foreign cultures had contact or influence in pre-Columbia America. One of the greatest proponents of isolationism was a man by the name of John Wesley Powell, who became director of the Bureau of Ethnology at the Smithsonian Institution in the late 1800s. Under Powell's direction, any artifacts discovered in America that contradicted the theories of evolution and isolationism were either destroyed or concealed in the vaults of the institution. Powell had a proclivity of trying to obfuscate any language that directly referred to giants. Uh, the discovery of giants in early American history uh, redundantly by different universities uh, left the Smithsonian in a position of needing to control the flow of information and they obviously wouldn't have liked that the discovery of giant bones supported the biblical narrative and not the Darwinian narrative. Lake Powell and the rivers that fed it were named after John Wesley Powell. Now John Wesley Powell is the guy that ran the Smithsonian and he had a problem. He couldn't accept the fact that people prior to his discovery were incredibly advanced seafarers. So when John Wesley Powell took over the Smithsonian and started heading it up, there was a real attempt to hide anything that was an out-of-place artifact, which is called an OOPART, O-O-P-A-R-T. At the turn of the 19th century, the agents of the Smithsonian Institution were confronted with a vexing dilemma. On the one hand, the institution's official dogma was Darwinism and isolationism. But on the other hand, out-of-place artifacts and the bodies of giants, in some cases, with red hair and arrayed in ornate copper armor, were turning up all over the United States, especially in the mountains. Americans today know almost nothing about the mystery of the mound builders, but in early America was a hot topic of the day. At one time, the landscape of the eastern United States was dotted with thousands of artificial mounds. What made the mounds so fascinating in the minds of the early Americans was what could be found buried inside of them. They were filled with strange artifacts and bones, including the bones of the giants. That giants were buried in the mounds of America was an undisputed reality in the 1800s. Even Abraham Lincoln, while waxing poetically about Niagara Falls in some lecture notes, assumes the fact to be commonly known. From the late 1800s through the early 1900s, universities across the United States and our own independent Indiana Jones types were taking to the mounds and doing excavations and quite often giant bones were being discovered and unearthed. And there are literally dozens, dozens and dozens of newspaper articles from reputable sources from the late 1800s through the 1900s discussing the discovery of giants eight feet tall, nine feet tall, uh, one of them that I read 12 feet tall. So prevailing was the question of the mound builders in the late 19th century that in 1881, Congress commissioned the Smithsonian Institution to conduct a widespread archaeological investigation of the mounds, which essentially granted the institution exclusive control over all mound excavations and subsequently the artifacts buried within them. And so they took control of the excavations away from many of the independent universities and sent in their own teams. They even called it the, the mound excavation teams, specifically targeting the American Indian mounds where many of the bones of the giants were being uh, discovered. The excavation teams tore through the mounds with great haste 
In just nine years, 2,000 of them were unearthed and tens of thousands of artifacts were carted off to the Smithsonian's repositories. They destroyed as much as they discovered in their rush to preempt any more civilian excavations and to confiscate the artifacts and bones that flew in the face of the institution's sanctioned narrative of American history. Ultimately, in accordance with Powell's doctrine, and despite many of the artifacts testifying to the contrary. The mound builders were officially declared to be ordinary indigenous peoples of the Americas. No further explanation was furnished by the Smithsonian Institution as to why six-fingered giants with red hair arrayed in copper armor, among other oddities, were sometimes discovered in the mounds. The case was closed. Powell's doctrine prevailed even as the vaults of the Smithsonian were packed with artifacts that categorically debunked his worldview. And many of the findings of the Smithsonian, which included people of extraordinary height and size, are still documentable to this day, even from the Smithsonian's own reports. For instance, the following is a brief list of documented findings, all recorded in the annual report of the Board of Regents of the Smithsonian Institution in 1875. Item one, one skull measuring 36 inches in circumference. Item two, one full skeleton with double rolls of teeth buried alongside a gigantic ax referred to in the report as a gigantic savage. Another part of that same report, giant axes and skinning stones, one weighing over 15 pounds, that had an ornately carved handle and was of such mass that it documented only a giant could have wielded this. Another jawbone that easily slipped completely around the entire face of a large man during the Smithsonian recording. And then there's the fifth annual report of the Bureau of Ethnology to the Secretary of the Smithsonian, where they document 10 more skeletons buried in a mass grave, giant skeletons. And then in the 12th annual report of the Bureau of Ethnology to the Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution in 1894, where it documents two enormous skulls, several baffling femur bones, and 17 full giant skeletons that were recorded. Now these are all documents that are still available. And so if one were to say, well, you're only reciting the conspiracy theory about the cover-up of giant bones that were excavated under the Smithsonian, no, these are actually in their own reports. So we do know that even though the Powell Doctrine was in place and there was an intentional effort to obfuscate the language around the recovery of giants, that indeed this was happening in early American history and it is part of the record. The mounds were not the only problem for the institution. All over America, from coast to coast, well into the 20th century, newspapers were reporting the discovery of giants and other out-of-place artifacts. Some of the most sensational stories were coming out of the Grand Canyon, a region that John Wesley Powell had personally explored on several expeditions. Rumors of hidden treasure troves, Egyptian and Tibetan artifacts, and giant mummies were appearing in articles across the nation. In 1909, the Phoenix Gazette published an article detailing the incredible finds of a Smithsonian-funded expedition led by Professor G.E. Kincaid, who allegedly discovered vast amounts of Egyptian-like treasure in hidden caverns and passageways in the canyon. According to the article, the treasure mysteriously vanished, and today, all records of the Kincaid expedition have been expunged from the archives of the Smithsonian Institution. We discovered that there was one event in which uh, Powell actually became angry and defensive concerning a discovery that was made inside of the Grand Canyon. He wrote this in a letter to the Smithsonian. He wrote, evidence of these so-called ancient giants migration from one territory to another cannot be mapped until we can study how the planes of the earth have shifted since the migration and these studies should only be carried out through purely geologic and paleontologic evidence. We cannot intelligently discuss potential giants until their home has been discovered and further until the geology of the people is so thoroughly known that the different phases of its geography can be presented. 
In truth, what many of the artifacts sequestered by the Smithsonian Institution had proven was that a non-indigenous race of giants migrated to the Americas in the very distant past. Theirs was an advanced culture, adept in the working of copper and other metals beyond the capability of the Native Americans and displaying genetic markers much more akin to the Canaanites of biblical fame. The question that vexed John Wesley Powell and the institution at large was not, was there a race of giants inhabiting pre-Columbia America, but rather, where did they come from? The answer to this question may reside on an enigmatic island in the Mediterranean Sea, where a Smithsonian-like cover-up has been ongoing for decades and is still in full force today. The island of Sardinia. The island of Sardinia is located in the Mediterranean Sea just south of Corsica and west of the Italian peninsula. During the age of the Roman Empire, Sardinia was home to Roman colonies and governed by Roman prefects. But little is known about the history of the island before the Roman occupation. What is known is that an ancient race of megalith builders called the Neurotic Civilization once inhabited Sardinia thousands of years ago. The Neurotic Civilization is shrouded in mystery and legend. No one knows exactly who they were, but the ruins of their megalithic towers called Naragi bear witness that they were mighty builders. Naragi towers were constructed with large, uncut stones in the Cyclopean style without the use of mortar. Some of the towers were relatively small, while others were astonishingly large, rising over 100 feet into the air. There are over 7,000 ruined Naragi towers still standing in Sardinia today. But archaeologists estimate that at one time there were more than 30,000 of them all over the island. Everywhere you go in Sardinia, you find the ruins of the Naragi towers and the stone rubble belonging to other megalithic constructions that once populated the landscape. Having traveled extensively all over the island, I am amazed that so little attention has been given to this place by archaeologists, considering how anomalous it is in regards to the sheer quantity of megaliths that were once present. But even more remarkable than the abundance of megaliths is the abundance of evidence pointing to the unassailable reality that Sardinia was once inhabited by a race of giants. Uh, originally, there were apparently 30,000 Nuragi all over the island. Now the estimation of uh, the Nuragi is approximately 7,000 to 8,000 uh, around Sardinia. Um, these towers were uh, the expression of the megalithic uh, architecture, which is also called the Cyclopean. The legends mention Cyclops uh, who built these megalithic structures around the island. They might have been very impressive and imposing in those times because when uh, the Nuraga were first built, the single tower could reach even 28, 30 meters height. It was like a skyscraper of the prehistory. And uh, Cyclopean, because of the legend, as if they were built by Cyclops or giants, but also because of the use of massive boulders, of massive stones, which were set in circles with no use of mortar binding. It must have been really hard to lift them, to move these stones, and even today engineers wouldn't know how to build this type of constructions anymore.
The impressive stonework exhibited in the Nuragi Towers is prototypic of the classical Cyclopean style. Cyclopean masonry is an archaeological term used to describe an antediluvian engineering technique which incorporated large stones without the use of mortar. Cyclopean masonry is the trademark of megalithic architecture all over the earth. The style ranges from rough-hewn stone structures as prominently displayed in the Nuragi Towers of Sardinia to incomprehensibly precise edifices devised with immense polygonal blocks, perhaps best illustrated in the walls of Sacsayhuaman in Peru. No one knows exactly how the megaliths were built because the knowledge of Cyclopean masonry vanished from the earth. But what we do know is who the ancients believed were the builders. All across the world where megaliths are present, legends of giants abound. The ancient Greeks, from whom we derive the term Cyclopean masonry, attributed megalithic building to a particular kind of giant, the Cyclops. According to the Greeks, the Cyclopes were the one-eyed offspring of the gods who were famed as gifted craftsmen and masons. The Greeks credited the giant Cyclops with building the megalithic construction found in Greece and throughout the Mediterranean. The Greek historian Posinius recorded that the walls of Mycenae and Tiryns and Peloponnesus were built by the Cyclops in ages past. Clans of Cyclopes were rumored to inhabit the islands of the Mediterranean. In his epic poem, The Odyssey, Homer recounts the harrowing voyage of Odysseus, king of Ithaca. During his wanderings in the Mediterranean Sea, Odysseus and his crew enter a cave on the island of the Cyclops, where they encounter Polyphemus, a savage one-eyed giant. Polyphemus devours some of Odysseus's men before they put his eye out with a spear and escape the island. In the next chapter of the story, Odysseus and his men are carried in a storm to a place called Lastragonia, which is a land inhabited by cannibalistic giants. The giants devour many of Odysseus' crew and destroy all but one of his ships. The Odyssey is obviously a work of fiction, not to be taken literally. But like many of the legends composed by the ancient Greeks, it may be laced with historical fact. The mystery schools and fraternities of builders throughout history have utilized the insignia of the cycloptic eye and its many motifs to communicate knowledge originating from a celestial source. The single orbed eye, open and watching, invokes the watchers who descended to the earth in the antediluvian age, their forbidden knowledge and their hybrid offspring. The Cyclops is the embodiment of these concepts. But was the Cyclops more than an esoteric symbol to the ancients? Was it a real flesh and blood creature? In Sardinia, many believe it was, citing the small island of Sant'Antioco in the southernmost province, known as the island of the Cyclops. My name is Paolo Valdes. I was born in Sant'Antioco in 1944. When I was young, I explored a lot in the mountains. And so I saw many skeletons among the ruins and the old houses in the countryside. One day, when I was eight years old, I was grazing oxen in the mountains. There was a nuraga nearby, so I decided to go and explore it. I went inside of the nuraga and discovered the giant skeleton of a man partially buried in the ground. When I looked at the skull, I noticed that he had only one eye socket in the middle of his forehead. Instead of two eyes, like a normal man, he only had one. He was very large. I could see his feet sticking out of the ground. He was much larger than a regular sized man. And this happened in the area known as the land of the Cyclops. Sant'Antioco lends credence to the Greek stories of Cyclopes in the Mediterranean. 
Not only are there ancient folkloric accounts of the Cyclops inhabiting this region of Sardinia, there are also contemporary claims that the skeletal remains of cycloptic giants were unearthed some years ago in plain view of the townspeople before being secreted away with threats of violence if anyone dared speak of it. Many of the people we spoke with in Sant'Antioco affirmed that they had heard of the incident but were unwilling to go on camera. Some even told us that the Cyclopes were exhumed right in the middle of town where the megalithic remains of an archaeological excavation can still be seen. I had no way to confirm if these rumors were true, but what I can confirm is that highly secretive and restricted excavations are still taking place in Sant'Antioco today. We were able to film one such area where some believe that the graves of giants had been discovered and were being disentombed. Could it be that the legends of giants and cyclopes in Sardinia are true? Are their remains being exhumed in secret and then hidden away to protect the conventional narrative of history and the institutions that propagate it? The answer is self-evident for those who have seen the bones. My name is Luigi Muscas. I am 53 years old and I live in Poli Albarei. I have been immersed in the ancient history of the giants of Sardinia ever since I was a little boy. It was handed down to me by my relatives. The first skeleton I ever saw, the first mummy I ever saw, was on a rainy day in the countryside of Poli Albarei. I was out grazing my father's sheep in the fields near the ancient ruins, when suddenly it started to rain. I got caught in a violent thunderstorm. I looked for a shelter among the ruins to get out of the rain, and I found a small stone doorway leading into a megalithic tomb buried in a hillside. When I crawled inside of it, I found the body of a dead giant. He was huge more than 10 feet long. He was mummified and well-preserved. His skin was the same color as mine. He had all his teeth. None one of them was missing. I counted them. There were 32. I wasn't even surprised to find him there. It only confirmed what my relatives had always told me. We were the descendants of the giants. He had a huge head, his legs were this thick, and there was still skin covering the whole body. And even the tendons were still there, the tendons connecting to the fingers. I told my friend about it, and we came back together to play with the giant. We used to joke around with his fingers and make them move by pulling on the tendons in his arm. We had fun pretending he was still alive. We played with the giants for a couple of weeks, until they took him away. This is one of the alleged tombs uh, that giant bodies were discovered in. In fact, this whole side of this hill overlooking the town of Pauli Albare uh, had tombs embedded into it. This particular tomb here is the tomb in which Luigi saw his first uh, giant when he was uh, when he was a boy. Luigi says the head of the giant was here facing the sun, facing the east, and the feet of the giant went underneath. This used to be a structure with a roof, a sarcophagus, and it's been filled in with dirt. So in other words, what we're standing on now was not the bottom of the tomb by any means. It went much further down and, you, and it was large enough for, for Luigi and his friend to get down into it when they were children. So it has been purposely filled in with dirt, so you can no longer access uh, whatever's inside of this tomb. We're going to measure this, uh, just so that you can see that it also is, is certainly large enough to fit the body of a giant. Uh, remembering that we're basically measuring the top of what was the roof of this uh, sarcophagus. So 
Um, it doesn't necessarily give us the accurate measurement. It would have been larger within, but we can show that definitely it was, uh, it was large enough to accommodate, that, to accommodate the body that Luigi found. From where the head of the giant would have been positioned to this rock face, which is not the bottom of the sarcophagus, but the top of the sarcophagus. The, uh, Luigi tells us that the feet of this particular giant extended down underneath this stone, which was the roof. We have a measurement of, of well over 11 feet. As you can clearly see, this is all that remains. These ruins were left because I stopped the excavators. They wanted to plant trees, like those trees over there. They wanted to destroy everything. The tombs, the pyramid, the other step pyramid over there, and part of the Nuragi. They wanted to destroy all of this, to plant trees and provide work for the youth. But it was just an excuse to cover up this history. So that day I was eating, and I felt compelled to leave my house and rush up here. I didn't know why I was coming, but it happens like that for me. When I feel I have to go, I go. And so I drove here with my car. I was speeding like crazy to get up here. When I got here, I stopped the excavators who were destroying everything. I told them, stop, and they stopped. They were under specific orders from the authorities to get rid of everything because these are the last ruins of this lost city, of this history, and they wanted to eliminate it so that nothing would be left. I've seen many times now the attempt by different governments, different organizations to cover up certain artifacts or certain megalithic sites by simply obscuring the view, in most cases, by planting trees, either around or in front of the objects that they don't really want people to be looking at. In this case, Luigi can personally testify to the fact that these trees, right around this area where these tombs of, of the giants are, were purposely planted in rows with the expressed objective to hide what is here from the view of the villages below. Basically, it's a way of saying there's nothing to see here, uh, don't pay attention to this, and certainly no tourists come to this particular spot. Nobody's here, ever. In fact, there's fences all around here um, that are broken down to keep people out. These also used to be tombs um, equivalent to the ones we've already filmed. There are at least two or three here in this row. There are dozens of tombs right in this area, right along this hill. And right in front of these tombs, trees planted in rows with no other purpose, ostensibly, except to block the view of these tombs. I spent a considerable amount of time on that hillside, overlooking the village of Pauli Arbare, inspecting what remained of the megalithic edifices that once stood there before they were intentionally broken to pieces by heavy machinery. One can clearly see that the debris of the demolition was simply scattered over the fields. It is evident that at one time in the distant past, dozens of tombs were constructed in an east-west orientation between two pyramidal structures and a Nurage tower. What I find very intriguing is that the pyramids seem to have been covered in quartz. A layer of crystallized quartz is still plastered on the exterior of many of the megalithic blocks. The presence of such regal monuments indicates that the deceased entombed between them must have been men of renown. We also measured several ruined graves that were configured in a north-south orientation in front of the tombs. They were all over 11 feet long and certainly spacious enough to accommodate the dead bodies of 10 foot tall giants, consistent with Luigi's descriptions of the mummified corpses that once occupied them. It's very likely, so we're told, 
that the bodies that were placed in these particular tombs, the giant bodies, the mummified bodies, are in fact still here. We're fairly confident that if we were to bring shovels up here and start digging, we would probably be arrested. And definitely somebody would come and stop us because uh, we get the feeling that we're under surveillance um, or have been under surveillance since we came into, the, into this area of Sardinia. When I told our story, they threatened me. They said they were going to shoot me and my family. We are continuously monitored. While we were filming around Pauli Albare, one of the town officials pulled up in his car and was watching us from a distance with a look of consternation on his face. He made a cell phone call before driving away. As soon as we got up to the hillside where the tombs are, a helicopter appeared on the horizon and hovered around the area until we left. Here in this country, the legends of the giants still get passed down. The legend of the lost civilization. But by now the stories are almost forgotten, because many of the elderly in the country have died, and the young people don't really care about our history. So, many of the old people that knew about the giants are dead. Only a few remember the stories, like my mother and Uncle Alfredo. My name is Alfredo Garau. I am 76 years old. I live here in Pauli Arbare. I was 17 or 18 years old when I started driving tractors. And while plowing in the fields, we would turn up these bones, me and my older brother. And we would say, why are these bones so large? They are not from cows or oxen. And so we would look at them and wonder, who could these bones belong to? We knew they were human. They looked like the bones of men. And so we didn't have the foresight to take any of them home with us. We would just leave them lying there, and there were many. I even found an ancient coin among them, but I don't have it anymore. They took it away from me. Also, I have seen a place in the countryside where someone built a fence for sheep. And there were piles and piles of bones gathered there. You know how they tie bundles of wheat. They put them in piles like that. There were a lot of them. A lot. My name is Filomena Cadao. I was born in Pauli Arbare on the 28th of October, 1939. We used to ask my father questions when we were plowing the soil because we would find pieces of femurs or teeth as big as a finger. So we would ask, what are these? Do they belong to animals? And he would say, no, those were big men that used to live in the past. My father used to always say that. The countryside of Pauli Arbare was full of these skeletons. In Cocciacas, there was a tomb that was 11 and a half feet long. We measured it several times with Luigi, and there was a skeleton inside of it. We measured the tibia and the femur of the skeleton. It was five and a half feet long. And that one was documented. As I would walk behind the plow, every once in a while some pieces of bones would pop up. We were very close to the Nurage of Senesi. There were many tombs there, and they were arranged in a circle, and they were enormously long. And my father would always explain to me that some time ago, this land was inhabited by the giants. When I showed my grandfather the mummy, he told me the whole story about them, how they built the Nuragi, how they built the tombs, the sculptures, everything. 
because he inherited the stories from his ancestors. This great civilization was, uh, let's say, was pervasive uh, all over the earth, because we find the same things with uh, the Sumerians, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Mayan civilization, the Inca, the Aztec. In all of the civilizations of the world, there are strong links with the civilization of the giants of Sardinia, because they dominated the entire world. And all of the megaliths in China, in Japan, in Asia, all over the earth, it all comes from the same civilization. Ultimately, this civilization, having rebelled against God, who created everything, was punished and destroyed. This destruction happened in one day and one night, with the overheating of the atmosphere, earthquakes, and with the water that came from the sea and buried everything, all of Sardinia. This was a universal flood. It wasn't only in Sardinia, so everything was buried underground. Why had the Nuraghe buried beneath the soil? Because the water came and buried them. It caught everyone by surprise. So everything they had is still buried inside the Nuraghe. The official story does not tell the truth, but if anyone wants to dig, they can still unearth this history inside the Nuraghi, the pyramids and the temples. The seeds to replant this great civilization are still there. So we are in uh, Barumini at uh, the archaeological site of Sunuraji, which is a UNESCO site. It is one of the largest Nuraghe complex of the island, and it's been excavated deeply in the 50s. Just before it was uh, excavated and investigated, the site looked like one of the many hills uh, which uh, characterize the scenery and the landscape of this uh, interior of the island, of the region called Marmilla. Underneath uh, the mud, the earth of these uh, hills, there are other archaeological sites. In all likelihood, Nurage, these megalithic uh, buildings of the island. Many of the largest megalithic edifices on Earth are still buried beneath a layer of sediment that was distributed over the surface of the planet during the Great Flood. As a result, the most massive and mind-blowing antediluvian constructions have yet to be unearthed or even acknowledged because their unbelievable size simply defies the conventional narrative of history. Sardinia, there are large mounds of earth covered in stone rubble. Beneath many of these mounds, the ruins of undiscovered Naragi towers or other megalithic edifices from the antediluvian age are hiding in plain sight. The largest of the Naragi towers in Sardinia were once thought to be nothing more than natural formations of the landscape before they were unearthed. In the midst of the region known in Sardinian legend as the Lost City, which was said to be the capital of a once great seafaring empire ruled by ten giant kings. An isolated conical hill rises high into the air. The ruins of a medieval fortress crown the summit, but pale in comparison to the enormous stone edifice rivaling the Great Pyramid of Giza, likely hiding beneath it. The skeptics refer to it as a conical hill, but the elders of the local villages call it an ancient pyramid. Could Sardinia have been the epicenter of a once mighty antediluvian empire? It would have undoubtedly required the resources of a great people to build the tens of thousands of megalithic towers that were once present on the island.
Aside from an abundance of evidence that Sardinia was once inhabited by a race of hybrid giants, there's also reason to believe that Sardinia may in fact have been the true location of the legendary Atlantis. The myths and legends here on the island of Sardinia are very analogous to the myths and legends of Atlantis. The people here, the older people, talk about a shining city, a city that was encircled by rivers, uh, a city in which learning and technology were greatly advanced, and a city that was ruled by giant kings. This is, of course, reminiscent of the story of Atlantis, especially as it was related by Plato and the Critias. Plato's dialogue Critias recounts a discussion between Solon of Athens and a priest of Nath in the Egyptian province of Sais. Solon is told by the priest that after being allotted an island for his dominion, the god Poseidon chose a wife from the daughters of men who bore him five pairs of twin sons, ten in all. Poseidon built a great city on the island for his offspring and made them rulers over a vast kingdom. The island and its city were called Atlantis, named after the eldest of the twins, Atlas. Other ancient sources disclose that the sons of Poseidon were no ordinary men, they were giants. Atlantis is an allegory for the antediluvian age in which the Watchers, the sons of God, descended to the earth to take away Wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Wives among the daughters of men who gave birth to giants. The watchers divided the dominion of the earth among themselves and appointed their giant sons as kings and demigods over their respective realms. But Atlantis was likely more than mere allegory. Plato records that the island of Atlantis was situated in front of the Straits, which the Greeks called the Pillars of Hercules. It is generally believed that the Pillars of Hercules refer to the Strait of Gibraltar, the gateway of the Atlantic Ocean. But evidence has surfaced in recent years suggesting an alternative location for the Pillars of Hercules, the Strait of Sicily. Ancient navigators passing through the Strait of Sicily would have been met with the vista of a singular island rising on the horizon, the island of Sardinia. What is intriguing is that many of the geological features of the island of Atlantis, as detailed by Plato, can be found in Sardinia, such as high mountains, naturally occurring thermal pools, and extensive deposits of mineral and metal that have been mined for centuries and are still mined to this day. Just like the legend of Atlantis, the oldest legends of Sardinia tell of a mighty kingdom ruled by ten kings who dominated the world with an invincible fleet, until the kingdom and its giant inhabitants were brought to ruin in a great flood. We have great fleets, we have pyramidal structures, we have cyclopean buildings, we have legends of giants all within this island off the coast of Italy. So the question is, was Sardinia the true location of the mythical city of Atlantis? Was Sardinia the home of an incredible race of hybrid giants building megalithic structures and in possession of advanced technology? There's no way to answer that question definitively, but certainly, if there ever was a real Atlantis, Sardinia could in fact have been its true location. For many of its residents, legends of giants in Sardinia are much more tangible than fairy tales or bedtime stories. They represent a true history authenticated by the bones, exhumed from the earth with their own hands. They also represent a forbidden history, because many of those bones were confiscated by the authorities as soon as they came out of the ground. Sardinia of contemporary times is a comparative case study of the United States at the turn of the 20th century as it relates to the confiscation and cover-up of artifacts pertaining to alternative anthropological and historical narratives, especially concerning the existence of giants. During a period of modernization in the post-World War II era, new foundations were being laid for residential and commercial infrastructure in the villages, and tractors were replacing horse-drawn plows in the fields. 
Consequently, many ancient graves were inadvertently turned up by the construction workers and farmers using industrial machinery. The bodies and bones of giants were surfacing all over the island. Rumors of giant skeletons and mummies were spreading throughout the villages. And just like in the United States during the late 1800s, the authorities were showing up to confiscate the evidence for purported archaeological purposes. But instead of representatives from the Smithsonian Institution, in Sardinia, government agents from the capital city of Kajari and Catholic priests, in some cases from the Vatican in Rome, were dispatched to seize the bones of the disentombed giants and secret them away to unknown repositories. There is a significant Vatican presence in Sardinia, especially in and around areas of archaeological interest. In fact, a domed church just so happens to be located right at the base of the solitary pyramidal mound sticking out of the landscape like a sore thumb. The church is the closest structure in proximity to the mound on the outskirts of the local village. Judging from our experience in other parts of the world, I highly doubt that the location of this church was an afterthought. When we were young, we used to go to church, and we would tell the priests about what we saw. We would ask them, what are these huge skeletons? Who are these big people? And they would tell us not to look at them, because they were devils. I would tell my grandfather, Grandpa, the priest told me that these are devils. And he would tell me, he is the devil, not the giants. So, whenever we would find these things, they would tell us to leave them alone, because they were devils. In fact, they burned the bones, but they were too large to be completely consumed, so they would gather them in piles, and then big trucks would come and take them away, because we didn't really care. We didn't know where they took them, but when they came with the trucks, they would load them with the bones and haul them away. But we don't know where they went, and since there were thousands and thousands of them, they probably burned them in a foundry or something, because where else could they put them? So they would make these skeletons disappear. And the church was always involved, because they didn't want people talking. They didn't want people talking about it. But there's something else. They always build their churches all over the world, right on top of archaeological sites. Why do they build them there? Because where these archaeological sites have been constructed, there are ancestral connections. They are directly coordinated with the heavens. So the ancient people that constructed them were directly tied into the heavens, into the universe. And the Church knew it. The Church has appropriated this history. They built all their churches and ecclesiastical monuments over the places of worship of this civilization. in the church of San Pantaleo. This cathedral is found in the middle of an archaeological area. As you can see from the floor here, there are steps which lead downstairs where there's a large necropolis and many other finds. Uh, this church is particularly significant because uh, later, around the 12th and 14th century AD, frescoes were added along the apsis and also on the side of the naves. And there are some very important symbols, like the Tree of Life, and also the Evangelist and the angels who mixed with the humans. And all these esoteric symbols you see around the, this church are quite uncommon. It is definitely one of the most bizarre churches I've ever been in. There are a lot of esoteric symbols inside of this church and uh, some very peculiar architecture. This is a, uh, another example of a Catholic cathedral being built right on top 
of something else. Oh uh, yes. Obviously, yes. there was a uh, there was some kind of other temple here because there's two different kinds of architecture, at least two different kinds of architecture represented here. Early Christian. The early Christian, but then there's something much older here. Yeah, underneath, probably ruins and remains of temples, and some of these. Uh, uh, parts were uh, recycled and reused inside the church as you can see even these pillars you can tell they're much more ancient than the church itself. So it's very possible that only the Catholic Church really knows what's under this particular archaeological area. Yeah. What's actually in the catacombs, maybe what kind of, what kind of uh, uh, skeletal remains are down there or have been extracted yeah. from beneath this chapel. Yeah. This is an old baptismal pool here below the altar of this little cathedral. And it's obvious to us that we have some newer construction, such as this pillar. But there's a lot of older stuff down here, too, that belonged to whatever temple or ne necropolis or whatever was here before the Catholic Church decided to build a cathedral over it. This wall is obviously blocking another chamber, another underground chamber beneath the cathedral. And we can see that there's actually an arch here. So this was, there was something else here, obviously. This was an archway, which means that this floor was probably lower, um, unless this is some sort of a sewer, who knows. But one thing is for sure, there's another cavern back there. And these rocks have been placed there purposely to block entry, and this wall has been built to block entry. But my guess is there's another, there's probably another entry somewhere else, maybe around outside of the church or somewhere in the vicinity to access whatever's below this location. So this is um, proof positive that when we say Catholic cathedrals are actually erected on top of ancient pagan constructions and catacombs and underground passageways, we're telling the truth. looking for Vatican conspiracies in Sardinia. But after my visit to the bizarre cathedral of San Pantaleo, it became quite clear that many of the most profound archaeological mysteries on the island had been sequestered long ago beneath the real estate of the Holy See. During a preliminary trip to Sardinia in 2015, we met with multiple individuals who told us that an ongoing cover-up concerning the bones of giants had been occurring on the island for many years and that the Vatican was at the center of it. Some of these individuals cited a particular excavation conducted in the early 80s beneath the small church of Santa Anastasia in the village of Sardra. One of the men involved in the excavation during its latter years agreed to a brief rendezvous in the streets of Sardra. Concerning the skeletons of giants, I worked in Santa Anastasia, where there is a neuragic archaeological site. I personally excavated two skeletons that were more than 10 feet tall. We placed them in the churchyard and left them there because they had to be inspected by the authorities from Cagliari, by Dr. Ugas and other people. I worked there in 1982, 83 and 84. The skeletons were taken to the municipal archive and now they're gone. 
They disappeared, and they made me shut my mouth about it. I took Luigi to the church of Santa Anastasia to show him where I found the skeleton. The outline of the skeleton was still visible in the tomb. But they make you shut your mouth about it. They don't let you say anything. I'm not crazy. I've seen these things. I personally handled the bones. The femur was this high. This part was like this high. They were like us, just taller, over 10 feet tall or so, with big heads, big hands, big feet, long femurs. Their hips were bigger. They were proportionally double our size. For example, I'm 5 feet tall. They were 10 feet tall. You understand? Does the government of Sardinia know that there used to be a race of giants living on this island? In your opinion? Yes, in my opinion, they know. I think they know, and they are covering everything up. When I worked for the municipality of Sardara, I worked there for one year, for six months, and then for another six months the following year. I found skeletons, I found artifacts, bronze statues, discovered the first nails made of bronze. And those were taken too, but I was able to get them back. But the skeletons of the giants are gone. Nobody knows what happened to them. In my opinion, the authorities from Cagliari are behind this. The church is also involved. Something is going on. The Masons are always involved. I think it's the Masons, the Illuminati, whoever they are. The Masons have the cash, so they hide everything. We have to just keep our mouths shut, you understand? So if I talk about it, or he talks about it, or someone else, we are just a few. They think we are crazy. My name is Giuseppe Pulici. I was born in Sardara. I live in Sardara. And I worked on the excavations of Santa Anastasia in Sardara. I was hired by the municipality of Sardara in 1979, 80 and 81. I was paid by the municipality of Sardara and I used to work there for three or four months at a time and I found skeletons of various dimensions. Some of the skeletons were giants. Their skulls were about three or four times bigger than ours. We measured the fingers on their hands. They were six to eight inches long, and their legs were extremely long compared to ours. We always carried the bones and the artifacts we found into the church and placed them on the large table. We worked in the early morning until about one o'clock in the afternoon. And after we left, someone would come and take everything away. All the bones we found there belonged to humans. We found many of them scattered around, which had decomposed or fallen apart over time. The bones were everywhere. I found a really big skull that was almost totally intact. It just had a small crack on one side and part of the spinal cord was still attached to it. In fact, my wife was out there with me that day. She helped me carry that big skull into the church. We placed it on the table with the rest of the artifacts. When we came back the next day, it was gone. Besides all of this, I also found some lens tips, some earrings, some pearls, some bronze statues some bars made of bronze, earrings, and many other things. There were also huge plates and cups similar to what we use for coffee, for example. But they were enormous. They were not like the cups we use today. I mean, they were cups, but they were enormous. On one occasion, we opened a chamber buried in the Nuraghe and discovered the skeleton of a giant that was seated at the table with an enormous plate in front of him. There were even some oysters 
muscle and clamshells that he had been eating still left on the plate. We carried the skeleton out of the nurage and placed it on the table in the church. And like usual, someone came during the night and took it away. We were finding so many bones and artifacts in that nurage that we were running out of space in the church. I went to the mayor to ask him if we could find another place somewhere else to put all the stuff we were finding there. He told me to mind my own effing business because it was not my problem. Excuse my French, but that's what he said to me. I'm Agos Vittorio, born on the 8th of January 1924. I live in Dolianova. Have you ever seen any giants? I've seen a dead one. Where? He was buried in the ground. As we were digging, we found the body of a dead person. And it was very long, incredibly long. It was as long as from where I'm sitting to the TV over there. It was incredibly big. Was it really so big? For sure, it was huge. I said to my friend, let's see if it's a woman, because it might have rings or jewels. Did he have any rings or jewels then? No, nothing at all. But I know that in the past, when I was a boy, some of my employers found golden earrings near the place where I found the skeleton. In that area. In the same area? In the same area. That area, it's called Santa Lucia, near Serdiana. The bones were everywhere. I think there are more still buried out there. I am Saio Virgilio, born on the 2nd of July, 1915. I'm still alive, with 100 years on my shoulders. When I was a young man, I worked labor jobs for money. One day, while digging the foundations for a house with my colleague, we found some Roman coins dedicated to Emperor Pius. When we dug deeper, we unearthed a sarcophagus with a large stone lid. The lid was very heavy and difficult to remove, but eventually we managed to lift it off with our picks. When we opened the sarcophagus, we were shocked to find the corpse of a giant. It was dressed in a black garment. Its bones were very long, and its head was enormous. It was definitely supernatural, not human. It was incredibly large. We couldn't believe our eyes. I, I told my other colleagues about it, and they started saying, Uncle Virgilio dug up a corpse. He dug up a giant corpse. They went to tell the priest about it, and the priest came quickly. When he arrived, I was examining the Roman coins with the inscription of Marcus Pius, and the priest said, I'll take those, give them to me. I have to take those coins to the regional council in Cagliari. So we asked the priest, uh, uh, what are we supposed to do with the skeleton? And he said, uh, break it into pieces and bury it under the foundation of the house. And that's what we did. We buried it under the foundation. We also found some giants buried near the Albajara Nurage. We were working for Natale Puschedo in his vineyards near the Nurage. There were several other workers with me. We were using plows and spades because we didn't have tractors in those days. The bones of giants were everywhere in that field. We found more than 20 skeletons of giants buried one on top of the other in cross configurations. So then, all of a sudden, the owner of the vineyard comes and tells us, guys, we have to stop digging because uh, 
because the government is intervening. Well, I needed the money more than my colleagues, so I continued to work after they left. When the owner returned, he said, what are you still doing here? I said, well, I need to work, you know. He said, no, 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 stop, I'll pay you for an extra day, but you have to leave because people from the government are coming. The government inspectors arrived while we were still there. They took pictures of the giant skeletons and examined the entire place, even the walls of the Nurage. They sealed up a passageway inside of the Nurage. I don't know where it led, but they sealed it up. And they took away the bones of the giants. Nurage Towers and the Testimony of Bones are not the only witnesses to giants in Sardinia. The ancient Nuragic culture itself bears all the hallmarks of a people interbred with the Rephaim. Rumors of human sacrifice and cannibalism have been associated with the mysterious Nuragic people since ancient times. In fact, many critics of Homer's Odyssey agree that Lastragonia, the home of man-eating giants, was Sardinia. The tens of thousands of stone towers on the island alone could have inspired Homer's pen, but it was most likely the hundreds of imposing megalithic tombs that solidified Sardinia as the land of giants in the minds of the ancient Greeks. All over the island of Sardinia, there are massive stone sepulchers famed since time immemorial as tombs of the giants. Most of the megalithic stones that were once incorporated into these ancient monuments were dismantled long ago by the residents of the local villages, many of whom claim that the bodies of giants once occupied the tombs before they were exhumed and hauled away. Even though these tombs are literally called the Tombs of the Giants, and the oldest legends of Sardinia recount that the bodies of dead giants were buried beneath them, conventional archaeologists deny that they had anything to do with giants. One of the most common contentions is that the bodies of the giants couldn't even fit inside of the tombs. It shouldn't surprise you that the people making this claim have never bothered to travel to Sardinia with a tape measure. So Luigi's demonstrating here that certainly a nine foot tall person, probably even a 10 foot tall person could, could indeed fit into this space. Remembering that these stones here have been, have fallen in at least six inches or so the rocks would have probably sat somewhere about where my hand is. Certainly enough room to fit nine, ten-foot giant. I verified that the bodies of giants could indeed fit into the tombs of the giants, contrary to the claims of armchair archaeologists. But it turns out that the contention is actually irrelevant, because many of the megalithic tombs were not designed to house the bodies of giants. Instead, they were built on top of them. So this is uh, one of the two different examples of the giant tombs we have in Sardinia. You have two different uh, 
tombs. This one has a huge stele hmm, with a little fake door. And then you have the gallery or corridor. The body was uh, uh, inhumate, which means it was buried underneath, and it was uh, buried first. Then the monument, the tomb, was built on top once the body had already been buried. Apart from the archaeological explanations, uh, we have legends in Sardinia which say that these tombs were used uh, by uh, young boys to stay in contact with the soul of the ancestors, uh, where they used to spend some days and nights uh, meditating alone, totally alone. This is called the incubation rite. Somehow these children uh, who were passing into uh, childhood were becoming adult, had to absorb the energy and power of the ancestors. And these are also described as giants or heroes. So we know that in legend there's always some truth. And uh, even if the door looks uh, small, we assume that the body of the person buried inside the tomb was buried first on a ditch, and then the monument was built on top. So it's not that the body was placed inside the tomb after the building was constructed, the other way around. So the interior of these tombs yeah. was not necessarily built to house a body, but most likely the body would have been buried beneath the tomb, and the aperture inside of the tomb was used for young boys during a rite of passage ceremony. Exactly. They would crawl into the opening, yeah. and then they would sit down in the gallery yeah. to absorb the might, the power yeah. of the mighty ones exactly. that are buried beneath them. Yeah, to become braver and to become more stronger and to become adult. Because those who were buried in these tombs, the entities Had that were buried powers. in these tombs, were yeah. heroes, were mighty ones. Yeah, they were the bravest. Excuse me, we'd like you to have this flower. Excuse me, sir, would you... Donation to the Reverend Moon. <laughs> For Jesus. Oh. Read about Jehovah's Witness. Ah. How about Buddhism? Uh. How about Jerry's kids? Oh, yeah. Scientology? Or nuclear power? Truth. And uh, even if the door looks uh, small, we assume that the body of the person buried inside the tomb was buried first uh, on a ditch and then the monument was built on top. So it's not that the body was placed inside the tomb after the building was constructed, the other way around. So the interior of these tombs yeah. was not necessarily built to house a body, but most likely the body would have been buried beneath the tomb, and the aperture inside of the tomb was used for young boys during a rite of passage ceremony, exactly. they would crawl into the opening yeah. and then they would sit down in the gallery yeah. to absorb the might, the power yeah. of the mighty ones exactly. that are buried beneath them. Yeah, to become braver and to become more stronger and to become adult. Because those who were buried in these tombs, the entities Had that were buried powers. in these tombs were yeah. heroes, were mighty ones. Yeah, they were the bravest. So this is the tomb of one of the tombs of the giants. There are many of these dispersed all over Sardinia. This is the actual tomb of the model that we were looking at in the museum in Cogedi, in the capital of Sardinia. This tomb, when it was newly constructed, uh, would have looked just like that model depicted. This is the, the, the inner chamber where Paula was telling us that the young people would come in to spend the night in order to absorb the power, the valor, the prowess of the mighty one or the hero buried beneath the soil, who very likely, in my opinion, was a giant. We know that the, the giants were known as the great heroes, even in Greek, Greek uh, mythology, 
even in Roman lore, were the great heroes and the mighty ones. The Bible calls them the Giborim, the mighty ones, uh, of old, of renown. And those are exactly the kind of entities that were buried here beneath the soil, beneath these graves, these megalithic structures. Some of the largest stones that I've seen incorporated into the megalithic structures in Sardinia have been used in the tombs of the giants. Like the one I'm standing on right now, it's just absolutely massive. These stones would have been very difficult for normal sized people to maneuver, to move, unless they were using some kind of technology that is lost to us today. The tombs of the giants provide us with an important clue regarding the origin of the Neurogic culture. Giants were considered to be the sons of the gods, the mighty men, and the heroes of old who had divine blood coursing through their veins. So the worship of the giants and the enshrinement of their dead bodies was a common theme in the ancient world, especially among the Canaanites. In the mid-1800s, two academics, one a Jesuit scholar named Antonio Bresciani, and the other an Oxford-educated lawyer named John Tyndale, conducted separate investigations into the neurogic civilization of Sardinia. They studied the Nuragi Towers, the tombs of the giants, and the cultural traditions of the Sardinian people. What's intriguing is that both of these men came to the very same conclusion the neurogic civilization was most likely founded by the Canaanites, who they believed had migrated to the island either before or during the conquest of Canaan by Joshua and the Israelites. Furthermore, they both surmised that just as the Hebrews had discovered to their dismay, when the Canaanites landed in Sardinia, there were giants in their ranks. The Jesuit scholar Antonio Bresciani wrote extensively about the origins of the Sardinian culture and its connection to the Canaanites, who the Greeks called Phoenicians. The Phoenicians were unrivaled stonemasons and seafarers of the ancient world who not only mastered navigation of the Mediterranean, but sailed all over the earth. Bresciani draws many convincing correlations between Phoenician pagan practices and Sardinian cultural traditions. He even describes the Sardinian rite of passage ceremony in which their children and young people would leap through the flames of large bonfires simulating the Canaanite practice of passing their children through the fire. In its most gruesome adaptation, babies and small children were literally fed the smoldering statue of the god Molech, who was depicted as a hybrid with a body of a man and a bull's head. The half-man, half-bull motif of Molech appears prominently in the statues and figurines of the neurogic culture. Even the tombs of the giants are configured in the shape of a bull's head, invoking the strong bulls of Bashan, mentioned in Psalm 22. And Og, the giant king of Bashan, last of the Rephaim in Canaan, whose bedstead was over 13 and a half feet long. There is compelling evidence all over Sardinia indicating that it was once inhabited by a Canaanitish race with Mesopotamian roots. There is even an ancient ziggurat on the island called Monte da Codi, complete with a monolith and sacrificial stone. It is the only ziggurat ever discovered in the Mediterranean and is archetypical to those found throughout the Middle East. The Greek biographer Plutarch recorded that when the Roman general Quintus Sertorius took the town of Tinges, he broke open the tomb of Anseus, the venerated Phoenician giant. Plutarch described the general's reaction to what he discovered inside. 
but great was his surprise when he beheld a body 60 cubits long. He immediately offered sacrifices and closed up the tomb, which added greatly to the respect and reputation it had before. What makes Plutarch's account even more fascinating is that near the town of Tinges, stone pillars had been erected by the Phoenicians, emblazoned with the inscription, We are the Canaanites who fled before the face of Joshua the robber, the son of Nun. Known today as the city of Tangier in northern Morocco, Tingis was located on the western point of the Strait of Gibraltar, providing the Phoenicians with undisputed access to the wider Atlantic. A ship sailing precisely due west from the port at Tangier, across the Atlantic Ocean, would arrive in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Thousands of years ago, when these voyages took place, a system of waterways provided passage from the sea to the Great Lakes, enabling the Phoenicians to penetrate deep into North America. It is a well-known fact that ancient copper mines once existed on the shores of the Great Lakes, especially in northern Michigan. The Michigan copper mines produce the highest quality copper in the world, with a trademark purity of over 99.5%. Michigan copper has been discovered in the Mediterranean, including on the island of Sardinia, among the oxide ingots extracted from the Neurogic ruins. There is no doubt that the Phoenicians were navigating the Great Lakes. An ancient petroglyph depicting a Phoenician ship was discovered in a place called Copper Harbor in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, along with the oxidized handprint of a very large man. It is no coincidence that many of the mounds in America harboring the bones of giants were concentrated in and around the Great Lakes Basin. So if the Canaanites, who the Greeks called the Phoenicians, did indeed travel to the early Americas, and there's a great deal of academic research to support that notion, are they the ones that brought these ideas about giants, the worship of giants, the opening of doorways and portals, and were there giants when they came? Did they establish a presence in early America? Were they doing here what the Hebrew Bible says they were doing in the Middle East where they were raping women, giving birth to hybrids? Is that the reason why the Anasazi at Chaco Canyon had graves with people that had polydactyly that they were worshiping? Six fingers, six toes, double rows of teeth, mutations that were buried here in the U.S., but they put jewelry around those extra digits. They were worshiping them as somehow being an author offspring of the gods. I believe that Sardinia holds the key to unlock the mystery of the mound builders in America. And they answer the question that vexed John Wesley Powell concerning the origin and migration of the giants. It seems that this ambiguous island in the western Mediterranean was ground zero for the Canaanite Rephaim and perhaps their primary stronghold against the divine holocaust mandated from heaven to exterminate their abominable race. The giants were dreaded hunters and cannibalizers of men, but they were also hunted by the hounds of heaven. When Joshua fought against the Amorite giants, God hurled hailstones down upon them and killed more of the Amorites himself than did Joshua and his army. Since their expulsion from the land of Canaan, the giant races were forced into exile and likely regrouped on the island of Sardinia and from there migrated across the earth. Eventually, the giants were either massacred or bred out in the populations into which they were absorbed. Their genetics and culture were preserved most prominently in the Phoenicians, who carried and seeded their genes across the globe, including in North America. The bloodline of the giants has gradually diminished over the centuries throughout the earth. But in Sardinia, it was apparently still manifest into the 20th century. Luigi's mother, Filomena, told me that her father was over seven feet tall and his father was over eight feet tall. And all of the elders of her people were of extraordinary height and were known throughout the land as the descendants of the giants. These skeletons, as I was telling you before, different varieties were unearthed. Some of them 
had elongated skulls, others had very long chins. I saw one with horns, this big, like a cow, and it had six fingers. These genes are still around today. Sometimes people are born with them. In fact, there was a boy in our village. They are no longer here, they moved overseas. This boy had six-toed feet. And this is generational, because his grandfather also had six-toed feet. These are ancient genes that we Sardinians still carry to this day. The Nuragi Towers seem to be directly linked to the tombs of the giants. According to written accounts from the 1800s, before many of the Nuragic ruins were destroyed, everywhere the megalithic towers stood, the tombs of the giants were close by. And we know that there were over 30,000 towers on the island. There may be tens of thousands of giants still buried in the soils of Sardinia today. It would seem that Nuragi Towers were not built for the living, but for the dead. Having studied and explored the Nuragi Anomaly, I am convinced that they were not merely constructed as defensive fortifications or housing complexes. They seem to mark the burial grounds where the giants were entombed and venerated. I believe that the most logical explanation is that the towers were built by the Canaanites for necromantic purposes related to the rite of incubation and the reawakening of the Rephaim. Rephaim is a term used by the writers of the Old Testament to describe the various races of giants that were living among the Canaanites. The term carries necromantic undertones relating to the underworld and the shades of the dead, implying that the spirits of the giants can be reawakened and reanimated in the land of the living. The Bible in numerous places refers to the Raphaim. Uh, this word is often associated with the shades of the dead and is considered by many Bible scholars to also directly refer to the spirits of dead giants in the underworld. The phrase Raphaim also carries with it the sense to heal, which some people have translated as meaning the ability to be revived from the dead, to be raised up again from the dead. In his book Physics, Aristotle makes a mystifying allusion to Sardinia during a dissertation on time in which he is explaining that unlike physical movement, the passage of time can only be perceived through change. But neither does time exist without change, for when the state of our own minds does not change at all, or we have not noticed its changing, we do not realize that time has elapsed. Any more than those who are fabled to sleep among the heroes in Sardinia do when they are awakened. For they connect the earlier now with the latter and make them one, cutting out the interval because of their failure to notice it. Aristotle's reference to those who are fabled to sleep among the heroes in Sardinia cannot be coincidental in light of the tombs of the giants and the legends concerning them. What Aristotle seems to be implying is that the heroes buried in the tombs, the Rephaim, the giants, can somehow be awakened or reincarnated and that when they are, they don't realize how much time has elapsed. During the ancient rite of incubation, young boys would spend prolonged periods of time alone inside of the megalithic tombs in order to commune with the Rephaim buried beneath them. It seems that the tombs of the giants and the Nuragi Towers were built as necromantic conduits for intercourse with the spirits of dead giants and likely possession by them. The Canaanites were famous for this kind of dark sorcery. In fact, after the Hebrews conquered the land of Canaan, they were explicitly warned not to engage in the abominable practices of the Canaanites, including passing their children through the fire, divination, consultation with familiar spirits, and necromancy, among other things. These practices were not only condemned because they were wicked, but because they were effective in placing their practitioners into contact with the shades of the dead and demonic entities. 
The Bible validates the idea that practitioners of Canaanite sorcery, with the aid of demonic spirits, can in fact open a gateway to the underworld and summon entities residing within it. In the book of 1 Samuel, King Saul employs the witch of Endor to call up the dead prophet Samuel so that he could consult with him. There was no question of whether or not she could actually do it, and no surprise when she actually did. Canaanite sorcery was effective, and that's why it was so hard to root out of Israel, even though it was a capital offense punishable by death. There are occultists who have the ability to communicate with other world, other dimensional entities. This is a biblical fact. If that is true, then are there those who also can somehow communicate with the mind of dead giants? Are they in some kind of stasis? Do they have some capacity where brainwave matter, for want of a better term, is oscillating around their presence? Is that why so many of the caves and the holy places around the world were built over the tops of the graves of the giants? because? The medicine men, as the natives would call them, told us on our most recent trip that they still are in communication with these entities. And I would say that it's not beyond the pale to believe that that's indeed possible because the Bible is the one that provides the narrative for that fact. Some years ago, I was told by a high-ranking special ops general that there are ancient giants hidden deep underground in a state of suspended animation. He told me that even though they're in stasis, their brain waves are broadcasting with such potency that it would melt your mind if you got too close. This information was later confirmed by researcher Klaus Dona, who relayed a story to me that was told to him by the world-renowned Russian optical surgeon Ernst Moldeshev. According to the story, a Tibetan monk took Dr. Moldeshev into a cave in the Himalayan mountains where an ancient giant was suspended in stasis. Dr. Moldeshev wanted to approach the giant but was warned by the monk not to pass beyond a line that had been drawn in the sand because if he got too close, the brain waves of the giant would destroy his mind. The doctor figured that the monk was exaggerating and crossed over the line anyway. But the monk had to immediately pull him back to safety because his head started to hurt so bad it felt like it was going to explode. One of the most overlooked aspects of end times prophecy is the idea that giants are going to return to the earth, are going to rise from the dead. Uh, most famously, Isaiah in Isaiah 13 uh, refers to Babylon as being utterly destroyed. He says, the vision which Isaiah son of Amos saw against Babylon, lift up a standard on the mountain of the plain, exalt the voice to them, beckon with the hand, open the gates, ye ruler. I give command, and I bring them. Giants are coming to fulfill my wrath. The return of the giants is not only prophesied in the Bible, but appears consistently as an end times theme in many ancient cultures all over the earth, including among the Native Americans who actually believe the giants inhabiting the underworld are going to emerge at the end of the age during a time of great tribulation. Some of the most top secret military operations happening all over and under the earth are conducted for the seizure of high value ancient artifacts related to the pre-flood world, fallen angels, and giants. The stage is now set for mankind to bring about the re-emergence of the Rephaim, while occultists are attempting to harness the ancient necromancy of the Canaanites, genetic engineers are working to reconstitute the genome of the giants with modern technology. Following the second Iraq war, I happened to be on Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie one night, and uh, George asked me, he said, Tom, given the fact that uh, there is very little evidence to tie Saddam Hussein into what happened on 911, he said, what do you think the true story is? Why did we actually go in 
to Iraq and put a presence on the ground. And so I said, well, there's a lot of theories around this, uh, George. Some people believe that our war colleges was telling us we needed to establish a presence. And so we created a false flag in order to invade this otherwise sovereign country. Others believe that we went there because of the oil. And so the, you know, the, the great oil families, the Bushes, uh, had a private interest in invading Iraq to establish a presence there. But then there were those who believed that because Saddam Hussein, who considered himself to be the resurrected Nebuchadnezzar, and had spent literally tens of millions of dollars rebuilding parts of uh, ancient Babylon, that in all of his digs and excavations that perhaps they had found something and U.S. intelligence was aware of it and that we had created a pretext so that we could invade Iraq to take possession of those artifacts. Now, it sounds like a conspiracy theory, and I was uh, uh, on the Coast to Coast AM radio show with George Norrie, unaware of the fact that listening to that program was a curator for the Iraq uh, Museum, the Babylonian Museum. So the show goes off. Uh, I hang up the phone. I'm getting ready to shut my computer off, and my computer pings that I've got an email, and I look up, and it's a curator from the Babylonian Museum. And they wanted me to know that what I was talking about was absolutely true, that we had gone into Iraq to capture something that Saddam Hussein had dug up from out of the plains of Shinar. So I vetted the email. Instead of using their link, I went to Google and typed in the Babylonian Museum to make sure I had the official website. They invited me to use a forward slash to an administrative page inside the museum, and they gave me a password. I used it and tried it, and in fact, it worked. And it opened up, and I was blown away by what I saw on these pages. Literally hundreds and hundreds of pictures of the very first day that the United States put troops on the ground in Iraq. We had flown a transport helicopter with a bunch of Marines who met at the Babylonian Museum with the U.S. ambassador. Whoever's taking these pictures, they've got a camera. It's just click, 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 click. I mean, literally every second, another picture. And so I was able to follow the trail of the ambassador. There's a woman with the traditional head wrap around her head that meets them outside of the Babylonian Museum. And they follow her. They go into the Babylonian Museum. They go to a great big door in the back of the museum. She unlocks this door, a very wide set of steps going down into a secret room that's down below the Iraq Museum. And the Marines, they all go down, and there are these very large crates inside this room, three, four times as big as a full-size human adult casket. Uh, large, square, maybe four feet off the ground, three feet off the ground. And so the Marines come in, and they start popping the tops with crowbars off the top of all these boxes. And they're pulling all kinds of of uh, gold masks, jewelry, cuneiform uh, circular tablets, all kinds of stuff up out of these boxes. They're looking at it, but it becomes obvious that they're actually searching for something because they keep putting these treasures that would be, the value is incalculable, right? But they keep looking for something else, and they're moving through to the back. And I go through these pictures hour after hour. I'm totally exhausted. I'm wanting to go to sleep. But finally, they get to the back of this underground room and these very large crates, and they pop the top off. And now they don't take anything out. I can't see what's in the box. But obviously, it's something they're very excited about because they motion for the ambassador and this woman, and they go over in front of the Marines, and they're looking down inside these crates, and he orders them to nail that one back up closed. Then they open another one, same thing. All these ones are in the back of the room by this back wall, and then the Marines are all brought in, and they get around these giant crates, and they carry them up this flight of stairs to the transport helicopter. They're all smiling about something. I don't know what's going on. I have no idea what was in the boxes because unlike the other headgear and jewelry and all these other artifacts, whatever this was, they didn't take it out of those crates. Was it the remains of giants? 
Was it perhaps the remains of Nimrod? Um, was it some kind of angelic technology? I don't know. I can only speculate, but I do know this for sure, that for whatever other reasons we invaded Iraq, we definitely went there day one when we put troops on the ground to go down into the bottom of the Baghdad Museum and carry huge crates up out of the bottom of that museum that had been hidden there by Saddam Hussein. Unfortunately, not long after that event, my home with the computer and all of the images burned to the ground under somewhat curious circumstances. I was in the house. I heard a series of popping sounds. I went to try to locate where the popping sounds were coming from and saw fire coming through the side of the wall of the house. And within a very short period of time, the house burned to the ground and I lost that computer and everything that was in it. During the expedition in Sardinia, I heard rumors of a deep black market that exists worldwide for the trafficking of arcane artifacts, including the bones of giants and the treasures associated with them. Sardinians joke that the richest people on the island are archaeologists because it's common knowledge that many of the priceless artifacts extracted from the neurogic ruins disappear into the black market where they are sold to representatives of prominent occult practitioners embedded into the highest echelons of society including top-tier politicians from all over the earth and eminent churchmen from the Vatican. The global cover-up of giants is not only fueled by ideologies hostile to the biblical worldview, it is also fueled by billions of dollars in artifacts and treasures discovered among the bones of the giants that never see the light of day. The ancient giants, both pre-flood and post-flood, were in possession of advanced knowledge and technology that is not only coveted by occult practitioners and collectors of rare antiquities, but also by military operatives. A super soldier genetic arms race has been escalating behind the scenes for many years. The military complexes of first world nations are actively pursuing the development of superhuman fighting machines. There is a multi-billion dollar black market for extractable DNA from the tissue and the bones of dead giants. Military genetic engineers are attempting to isolate the angelic genes that giants inherited from their fallen angel fathers and unlock the secrets of their size, strength, and supernatural capabilities. What happens when those who believe they can control the giants find out the hard way that human beings have always been nothing more than a convenient meal for them? Just like the Navajo legend of the Anasazi who through sorcery opened a portal to the underworld and unleashed giants upon the earth that devoured them all. The enemies of God are about to become the architects of their own divine judgment.